Major funding for NJTV News is provided in part by the members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. And PSE&G, we make things work for communities. Tonight on NJTV News, a scar on the Scarlet Knights. Another Rutgers athletic program hit with charges of abuse and the athletic department leadership accused of doing nothing about it. Plus, young people are taking up vaping at greater numbers and at younger ages. Hospitals sound the alarm. Another study shows that despite its ongoing renaissance, Newark remains a tale of two cities. The challenge, how do you transfer some of that new wealth to Newark residents? County clerk's offices are already reporting an unusually high number of requests for vote-by-mail ballots. Will that make the difference in this year's turnout? And it was a dog day afternoon for a hospital's therapy squad tricked out for a Halloween treat. Those stories are more next on NJTV News. Live from the Agnes Barris NJTV studio at 2 Gateway Center in Newark, this is NJTV News with Mary Alice Williams. Hello, thank you for joining us on air and online. Bombshell allegations against another Rutgers athletic program. For the third time in six years, coaches stand accused of tactics so abusive more than half the players have left. In 2013, it was the basketball coach for pegging balls at his players. In 2017, the swim coach for verbal abuse. And now seven former softball players and their parents have outlined disturbing incidents in a 23-page legal notice obtained by NJ Advanced Media. Michael Hill has the story. A field of nightmares for Rutgers University softball team. Lately, a competitive winning program, but losing players who accused the coach and her volunteer assistant husband of fear, intimidation, and abuse, both physical and emotional, as reported by NJ Advance Media. Outfielder Aaron Collins quit and told the paper people just didn't feel safe on the team. Nine other players left the team in head coach Kristen Butler's first year. Butler has denied any wrongdoing and told the paper the same about her husband. Among the former players' allegations, according to NJ Advance Media, from minor transgressions, Butler would punish players with demoralizing drills and workouts, and some would become physically ill and require medical attention. Butler's husband, Marcus Smith, who left the team at the end of last season, would confiscate players' mobile phones at night on field trips and go through them and even turn them back on to see the pop-up notifications. The players also reported Smith would board the team bus of women players and tell them it smelled like period blood. NJ Advance Media reports the charges are in a legal document that an attorney sent to the athletic director and his deputy director. They both denied accusations and doing nothing about player and parent complaints. The AD reportedly responded to NJ Advance Media with, you guys are effing scum, and later texted, he apologized for my words. This narrative around are you being a place where abuse is tolerated is bull. In the last six years, Rutgers fired two coaches, Mike Rice and Petra Martin, over abuse allegations. Both reached financial settlements with the university. The allegations of fear, intimidation, and abuse in the women's softball program here were news to many of the students NJTV News approached, yet several of them had plenty to say. It's horrible. I mean, you know, no athlete should be pushed to that extreme. It's a sport. They're supposed to have fun with it. They're supposed to love it even in these higher levels. I just, it's, it's just, it's disrespectful. So if the allegations are true, right, that's, that's disgusting, right? I mean, we're living in a time where this is supposed to be uh, not acceptable, but clearly it's, it's still happening. Um, I, I didn't know about this. I didn't know that this happened at Rutgers. That's like, that's really disturbing. Um, I hope there's like a, a process to this, right? Like um, more evidence gets brought up Maybe we can flesh this out because, I mean, you have to be fair. University President Robert Barchi issued this statement. He says Rutgers is committed to a culture where nothing is more important than the health and safety of our students. That commitment is shared by the athletics department. Whenever concerns about student safety are presented, the university investigates those concerns in accordance with the best practices of the NCAA and our own protocols. And the athletic director apologized about the F word he said 
He said he acted inappropriately. He also said those concerns were reviewed and where remedial action was necessary, changes were made. A report to the NCAA of a single level three violation for allowing individual student athletes to practice a total of two hours more than allowable over the course of a two month period was reported to the NCAA. The volunteer coach, Marcus Smith, was separated from the team. And tonight, Barchi is calling for an outside investigation of those allegations. Mary Alice, back to you. Thank you, Michael. A whole new generation of children as young as 10 are at risk of becoming addicted to nicotine directly related to vaping. That startling assertion is in a new report of data compiled by the New Jersey Hospital Association, which points to an uptick in the number of young people being hospitalized with illnesses that could be related to e-cigarettes. Leah Mishkin interviewed the association's president, who says the report should sound the alarm. In the past, where we'd seen um, the earliest age being around age 12, that we started to see age 10 presenting in hospitals and actually also having smoked uh, vapes or e-cigarettes. New Jersey Hospital Association President and CEO Kathleen Bennett says new emergency room department records show patients reporting having used e-cigarette devices are now as young as 10. Vapes, e-cigarettes, hookahs actually correlate to some of what we're seeing in terms of an uptick in hospital utilization. A new report by New Jersey Hospital Association looked at emergency department and inpatient claims data from January of 2017 to August of this year to get more information about e-cigarette use across the state. The hospital claims data reveals an overall increase in e-cigarette use over the years. From a little more than 6,000 in 2017 to what is being projected to be nearly 16,000 in 2019. In New Jersey, the data shows e-cigarette use is most common between the ages of 18 and 24, primarily among males in the state. When you have 16,000 cases that present um, in a hospital, whether it's in the emergency or, or department or an in inpatient, and have things like, you know, heart, um, you know, chest pains, or they are experiencing shortness of breath, that there is something taking place that we need to better understand. Dr. Joseph Underwood is emergency medicine chair at Hackensack University Medical Center. He explains the trends that are highlighted in this report reflect what they're seeing at his hospital. It could be a mild, self-limited, um, uncomplicated respiratory symptom, uh, or it could be fulminant respiratory failure requiring somebody to go on a ventilator um, or anything in between along that spectrum. The latest Centers for Disease Control numbers released this week show a total of 1,888 cases of e-cigarette or vaping product use associated lung injury across the country. The CDC death count has now reached 37 people. In New Jersey, there have been 27 confirmed cases and one death. According to the CDC, THC has been found in most of the samples tested by FDA, but the CDC emphasizes it has not identified the cause of the lung injuries, nor have they been officially linked to vaping devices. I don't think that we're at the point where we can say that there is a causation. What we can say is that there is a correlation. And, um, you know, as we look at this, I think, more deeply in the coming years, we'll start to be able uh, to tie in whether or not there is a direct causal link. It impacts um, many, many people and vulnerable populations like children who really don't probably don't fully understand what they're getting into. Dr. Underwood says education is key during this time. His hospital network, Hackensack Meridian Health, has launched a million dollar campaign to combat the vaping crisis. That money will in part be given to schools and community groups. In Hackensack, I'm Leah Mishkin for NJTV News. You can find in-depth reporting on the vaping crisis. Who's at risk and how widespread is it at njspotlight.com. New Jersey's largest city is rising on a tide of a development and technological renaissance that's redefining Newark, but not every resident is rising with it. In fact, new data suggests there's a racial barrier to accessing wealth and opportunity. Senior correspondent Brenda Flanagan has a tale of two cities. 
Life's good for people in Newark's gleaming corporate towers, Prudential, Audible, and JPAC, grown during the city's recent renaissance. But that capital wealth's not flowing to Newark's minority neighborhoods, according to a new report unveiled today by the advocacy group Prosperity Now during a discussion at Prudential. This isn't about data alone. Data only tells part of the story, right? This is actually about transformation. It's about us coming together as a community and creating a model city here in Newark. Migrants and immigrants founded Newark and built a thriving city, but white flight to the suburbs accelerated during the 1967 rebellion left a town of mostly black and Latino households. Census maps show residents live in segregated clusters here. The report says wealth is segregated too. The median income for blacks in Newark, about $32,000, almost 34,000 for Latinos. Whites earn 35% more, close to $50,000. And while companies in Newark are hiring, one advocate recalls the corporate narrative. And you're not going to try to hire people on broad. You've been to broad market, Ryan. You're not, you're telling me to hire those folks? Literally, that's how it, it came to us, right? So even the narrative around hiring local residents was colored, no pun intended, by race. Systemic racism is so deeply embedded um, in the economic structure that even with black leadership in this city for the past 50 years, we're still behind. Which in part explains jobless rates, 15.8% for blacks, 7.9% for Latinos, 6.2% for whites. Panels discuss data and disparities until Mayor Ras Baraka noted Riley. Data is probably been steady for 50 years, uh, we've been poor in this city f since we got here. And that's like uh, not a revelation. What are we doing with that information besides talking about it? One statistic stands out, home ownership. That's how people begin to accumulate wealth and assets. But the study shows that less than 25% of people of color own their own homes here. In New Jersey, the median net worth for a black family is 5,900 bucks. For a Latino family, about 7,000. For a white family, $309,000. Uh, people can't save money because they don't have it. And so the, 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 the idea is to get people more money, right? Get more money in their pockets. And that's, that's what we are trying to do, and home ownership is the basis of wealth in this society. The city's promoted job fairs and apprenticeship programs. The Institute for Social Justice wants to help people save with individual development accounts. Where individuals can have match funds at a progressive rate based on money that they're putting in, it can be matched. How do we pay people a living wage where they can, let one, not just subsist, but flourish? And part of flourishing means earning enough to build wealth. He figures a living wage, 25 bucks an hour, might finally help people build enough wealth to buy a home and flourish. In Newark, I'm Brenda Flanagan, NJTV News. Tomorrow's the day to start signing up for Obamacare. It's open enrollment season for anyone not covered by their employers or Medicare. And as the state of New Jersey starts taking control of its health insurance market, it's hiring navigators to help and spending more than $3 million to get the word out. Joanna Gagas has what you need to know. This administration in Washington cut both the enrollment period in half and they cut the funding to promote the enrollment period. Governor Murphy addressed a room of health care navigators to explain how federal rollbacks to the health care exchange led New Jersey to create a state-operated exchange. This year will be the first of a two-phase rollout, and the governor said the state is putting its money where its proverbial mouth is. We're just announcing, literally hot off the press, $1.1 million in new money on navigator grants. So you've got the one and a half million to promote this. You've got 1.1 million, which is hot off the press on navigator grants. And I think we were discussing another 500,000 yet to come to sister organizations around the state, community organizations that will help us propel uh, our, our message even further. New Jersey Citizen Action is one such organization that's working to enroll people at the ground level. 
Healthcare Program Director Maura Collins Grew says they're particularly interested in hard to reach populations and the money will make a difference. It's engaging immigrant organizations and others for more vulnerable populations who have heard a lot of uh, information that's not correct, who have been scared off from enrolling, when in fact there are many options for them to enroll. So empowering those organizations to put staff on the street to do outreach directly by phone uh, is really important. Department of Banking and Insurance Commissioner Marlene Caridi explained some of the limitations the state faces in this first phase of the exchange. While we've taken back control of the exchange, we still have to adhere to rules from the federal government, such as the six-week window, so the enrollment period is from November 1st to December 15th. One of the things that we're hoping that by 2021 we'll be able to expand the enrollment period. We haven't discussed the period of time, but we're looking to expand that enrollment period. She said New Jersey has the benefit of learning from the mistakes of other states that launched exchanges in 2014. And a key goal is to reach large populations of uninsured in the state. It's our goal to make sure that we let them know that it's available. There's financial assistance for many that's available. And more than anything else, they should not be afraid to come forward and ask for insurance. It's a right. In this first phase of the rollout, people can log on to getcovered.nj.gov to see what their options are and what the savings could be. But they'll then have to go onto the federal exchange, healthcare.gov, to actually make their selection. But by this time next year, New Jersey's exchange will be fully running and people will be able to stay on the state site to sign up. In Trenton, Joanna Gagas, NJTV News. Governor Murphy's taxes top tonight's business news. Here with that and more is Rhonda Scheffler. Rhonda. Mary Alice, Governor Phil Murphy and his wife Tammy made $2.2 million in 2018, the smallest amount of money they've made in nine years. The governor's office released the Murphy's tax returns for last year, which was Murphy's first year in office. The governor's taxable salary was $147,000. Most of the Murphy's income is from investments in the stock market. The couple both previously worked at Goldman Sachs. The Murphy's paid about $833,000 in state and federal taxes and donated over $627,000 to charity. A developer with ties to Jared Kushner has revived its legal battle against Jersey City. Kushner Companies and its partner KABR has filed a new lawsuit just one month after a federal judge dismissed the old lawsuit over One Journal Square. This new suit, just like the old one, claims the developer was denied tax abatements for a planned residential project for political reasons. Jersey City's Mayor Stephen Fulop, a Democrat, has denied that. A spokeswoman for the city said the new lawsuit is just another attempt by the Kushners to use an unfounded lawsuit for favorable, favorable treatment, adding, quote, they will lose in court just as they lost the last time. Kushner, President Donald Trump's son-in-law, used to run the company that bears his name before he became the president's advisor. Starting tomorrow, it's going to be more expensive to take the air train at Newark Airport. Fares for the air train will increase from $5 to $7.75. The Port Authority says it's the first fare hike in 16 years that increases the first of a series of toll and fare hikes recently approved by the Transit Authority. Also tomorrow, path riders who use smart links will lose some of the discount for using those cards. Ridership on the path set new records for the year through September 30th. The Port Authority says the path system handled average weekday ridership of more than 285,000 passengers during that period. Passenger volume also hit a record at Newark Airport with 34.6 million travelers making their way through terminals A, B, and C. On Wall Street, stocks retreating today. The Dow slid 140 points. And those are your top business stories. The House of Representatives has taken its first full vote on the impeachment inquiry into President Trump.
The resolution laying out rules for the process passed virtually along party lines. No Republicans voted to approve the resolution. Only two Democrats joined Republicans in voting against it, including South Jersey Representative Jeff Van Drew, who issued a statement saying he'll nonetheless, quote, be making a judgment call based on all the evidence presented by these investigations. The state's only Republican representative, Chris Smith, also voted no. Every other member of the Jersey delegation voted yes. Ahead of Tuesday's statewide vote here, mail-in ballots may play an unprecedented role. Hundreds of thousands have already been received by county boards of elections, which are gearing up to count them all and bracing for potential delays in calling close races. Remember last year, Representative Andy Kim's victory wasn't called until eight days later? But mail-in ballots are the new trend. Here's Brianna Venosi. So it's the exact same ballot. Within seconds, the crisp red, white, and blue ballot slides out of printer into hand. It's one way Union County Clerk Joanne Brajapi hopes to keep up with this year's soaring number of requests for vote-by-mail ballots. We are up to 30,000 vote-by-mails that we sent out which is a very high number for us. I think in the highest presidential activity, we did 16,000. The technology is being pilot tested at the clerk's main office in Elizabeth, the first in the state. Voters picking up a ballot in person will have it custom printed on the spot using their name and district. Rajapi expects it'll come in handy now that Governor Murphy signed into law automatic vote by mail enrollment for anyone who used it during the last three election years, unless they opt out. Out, leading to an unprecedented amount of interest. If it all goes smoothly, county clerks say it should cut down on the burden it created. I have 66 different ballot formats and pick from one of them to get your exact ballot, check it to make sure it's the right ballot, and then give it to you. Time consuming. Very time consuming, labor intensive, and very costly. It was at least $3 million to implement the most recent three elections. That doesn't include the special elections, the fire district elections, the municipal elections, um, and it doesn't include um, all of the costs moving forward. The head of the Association of Counties filed a case with the State Council on Local Mandates over the cost after Governor Murphy put the $2 million set aside by the legislature for it in his so-called lockbox during the budget. The case is still pending, and the counties are feeling the pinch. The last time the legislature was top of the ticket, we had about 57 thousand ballots cast countywide, um, you know, and we've mailed out 29,000 vote by mail ballots. According to the State Division of Elections, there were just over 600,000 vote by mail ballots requested as of today. NJTV News has obtained data showing over 275,000 of those went to Democrats, nearly 150,000 to Republicans, and another 169,000 for unaffiliated voters. This does not include third parties. To put it in perspective, the number skyrocketed between 2017 and 18. 18 for the general elections when the law originally went into effect from just over 180,000 up to 400,000 residents casting their vote using a mail ballot in 2018. There's no question that the automatic vote by mail ballot measure that we have now where people just receive it automatically is benefiting the Democrats. And that's because the Democrats saw this coming, worked with the governor to get this done, but were preparing for it in a way that Republicans were not. Democrats say the effort expands the process to more residents, despite their nearly one million voter edge over Republicans. Even for a low turnout year, the vote by mail numbers are expected to be unprecedented. If you're still planning to vote by mail, not to worry. You have until 3 p.m. on Monday, November 4th, to come in person, fill out an application, and receive a ballot. Then you have until 8 p.m. on election night to turn it in. If there is an upset in this year's races, political experts say they'll be looking to the mail, not the polls, for the answer. Brianna Venosi, NJ TV News. Next Tuesday is when NJ decides. After polls close, you can head to njtvelectionnight.org for the most updated results. And at 11 o'clock, NJTV News will bring you full election coverage, including live updates from key races around the state.
It's Halloween, and this year the holiday is taking on another hue, blue. One in 34 New Jersey children has been diagnosed with autism. So costume candy collectors carrying blue buckets are signaling they're on the spectrum and may not be able to holler, trick or treat, and blue pumpkins on doorsteps mean the family is special needs friendly. Doorstep sporting teal blue pumpkins offer kids with food allergies treats you don't have to eat. Kids in Camden who can't leave the hospital had the treats come to them. A bevy of compassionate canines tricked out in healthcare provider wear paid a visit to Virtua Our Lady of Lourdes Hospital. These therapy dogs from the Tri-State Canine Response Team roam these halls weekly to bring cheer and get belly rubs in return. And today, they got to dress up for the occasion. Support for the medical report is provided by Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. Tomorrow on NJTV News, the fight intensifies in the Airbnb wards just days before the big vote. To share any story you've seen tonight, go to njtvnews.org. I'm Mary Alice Williams. For all the men and women of NJTV News, thank you for being here. We'll see you tomorrow. W.J. Barnabas Health. Let's be healthy together. NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than 100 years. And Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association.